Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you, everyone, tonight to this discussion on COVID-19 and the implications for health provision across the island uh, and an all-island health service. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by medical experts to explore the possible benefits of an all-island health service and how this might better protect the health of all people on this island in the event of further health emergency. Tonight on the panel, we have Professor Gabriel Scali, uh, who studied medicine at Queen's University. He was the director of public health for the east of the province until he moved to England to be a regional director of public health. He recently carried out the inquiry into the cervical uh, check failures in the Republic of Ireland. He is currently a professor of public health uh, at the University of Bristol and president of epidemiology and public health section of the Royal Society of Medicine. We also have Dr. Alona Duffy. Alona is a general practitioner principal in Monaghan and medical director of North East Doc GP out of our service for the Northeastern region and Northern County Dublin. Alona is also a postgraduate GP medical educator. We also have the eminent Professor Jim Dornan. Professor Jim Dornan, Dornan was an NHS consultant obstetrician in fetal medicine, Queen's University, and is now head of department at RCSI Medical College in Bahrain. So I just want to welcome you all. Thank you all for giving us the time, uh, giving us your precious time tonight. And I'm going to start off uh, this discussion maybe with yourself, Gabriel, if that's okay. Um, so rather than looking back at the errors that might have been made by both administrations on the island, for example, the influx of Italian rugby supporters in Dublin, the travel to Cheltenham from both parts and the late closure of schools in the north, how can we better be prepared um, and have a coordinated approach to tackle a second wave of COVID-19 if it happens? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good point. We shouldn't look back too much, but we should remember one or two good things that happened, which was that people kind of knew themselves what the right thing to do was and were ahead of the governments, I think, mm -hmm. in some ways. And you just need to look at what happened uh, around school closures and some, some parents removing their children from school in advance of that, even some principals closing their schools. So I think the people have a good instinct and we should uh, trust people's instinct a bit more, I think, around that. Yeah. But in terms of what we do now, uh, you're right. In a sense, the restrictions have allowed us to reset the clock a bit. We have to get the numbers away, way down. Uh, and then we can, but what would be really useful, I think, and essential would be uh, the North and the South to agree a joint set of criteria for easing the uh, the restrictions because the WHO criteria are completely different from the ones that uh, have been adopted at Westminster and they're missing several things. Um, we're lucky I think that there is now a memorandum of understanding which is a great document uh, agreed between North and South and in that the ministers signed up to it and, and they said that they would do everything possible to in coordination and cooperation uh, between North and South. And the final sentence of their statement said, protection of the live island is paramount and no effort will, will be spared in that regard. So I'd really like them to spare no effort. And I think we should all hold them to it. And the yeah. four things I would say are very simple. One is we need to do the case finding, testing, tracing, isolating um, properly, north and south. It's not evenly done at the moment. We need public health checks at the borders, at every port and airport, uh, to make sure we're not importing new cases because China and South Korea, who have got it down to zero, are returning to those countries. Their own citizens returning from elsewhere and bringing ca cases in, public health checks at the ports and airports. Yeah. We need to further restrictions. If, if cases boil up in a, a town or a village or in a, in a, a rural area, we need to decide what can be done and will we be able to quarantine those places. We don't want to have to oppose restrictions on everyone if it's a localised problem. So we need to be, I think, upfront with people in advance about what local restrictions could possibly be put in place. And a final plea is around the data and making sure that we've got 
comparable data north and south so we can actually see what's going on. Because as, as uh, the leader of the WHO said, you can't fight a fire blindfolded. And in some cases, that's what we're doing. I think the, the, the North, uh, the North data has been very heavily criticised by the UK Statistics Authority, and we need better data, Smilis. Okay, and I don't know if uh, Jim or Ilona would like here on on, and maybe do you have a comment? Yeah, I'd I suppose being on the border um, as a GP right on the border, we've seen the difficulties because we have patients who either kind of maybe live or more and more commonly work across the border. And there have been difficulties when the initial shutdown came. Again, there was confusion with regards to the schools here because we knew schools across the border with the kids coming back from Italy had closed mm -hmm. here. They hadn't. There were issues when the, the pubs were closed and when things started to go into lockdown that that wasn't happening across the border. So people were actually migrating over to socialise. And we're still seeing issues where, you know, the two counties on the border, Monaghan and Cavan, have amongst the highest rates of COVID in the country. Now, not all, we can't blame all of that because of being on the border. There are other issues at play. But definitely that, that over and back just isn't helped. And again, as Gabriel said, it is creating difficulty with the contact tracing. We need to hammer that down. We need to have kind of equal amounts of community tracing because here in the South, we are doing, we've opened opened up the tracing or the, the the testing this week which means we're going to get more of a feel of how it's spreading in the community but we need to have that happening across the border as well okay okay, okay. i suppose the only thing i would add is it's i'm out watching the whole thing from bahrain and you can't help wondering how it is that um everybody's got so many different ways of doing it uh the south koreans the swedish the new zealanders the uk the republic um Bangladesh. You know, it'll be interesting at the end of the day to see what was the perfect way to do it. Uh, but I think looking at it from here, well done to the people of our, our, on both sides. I think they've been, the discipline has been excellent overall. Yeah. Okay. Well, while, while I have you there, Jim, I might just um, ask you um, do you think? I think it's the main opposition to a single health system, the fear of losing control uh, and sovereignty by both administrations in the North and the South. And how could this be addressed? And does a unified health service have to wait until there is a political union? Well, Francis, I mean, certainly in these islands, um, health is a political football. It's not everywhere in the world. And there's a great debate goes on as to whether it should be be left to politicians or health experts should be in charge of health. So obviously if there was a union and it happened tomorrow, then there would be a political imperative to get them. But I'm quite glad that it's going to be a medical imperative. And I think logically the two should start working together even more than they are now and that they should grab the moment. I mean, both the health service, uh, the NHS and the HSE are, have both been performing suboptimally in the uh, past decades or so. Um, money has been thrown at them, and sometimes it works, but it's very sporadic in the improvement. And uh, the people, the potential uh, patients of Ireland have so much in common, I mean, genetically. <laughs> aspirationally, socially, ethically, we're all very, very similar. And our special uh, lot um, we all follow similar pathways, attend similar colleges and everything else. So we're, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet and we use the same guidelines very much. Um, when we were both in the EU, academically, it was a wonderful time. We all were together uh, and research-wise, it was wonderful and we'll have to work hard at trying to keep that together. And, and there are examples of the two health services working together really well. I mean, from my point of view, being an obstetrician, I'm absolutely delighted at the unique um, world-class initiative of the congenital heart disease um, uh, uh, that is a network that has been set up between the two countries. I mean, it's just perfect. Now, it's built on a Swedish model, and the Swedish showed that if you put all congenital hearts into two units, you could reduce mortality. 10% to 2%, and Ireland is now doing that. So I hope that we will move forward with uh, not uh, towards looking at every area 
that we could be the best for the people of Ireland, not just North and South, but every area, every area should be looked at and said to see, would it be optimal if we did it together? And that's the way I would like to see us going forward. And there are many, many areas, especially mm -hmm. along the border and the north. Can you hear me okay? Have I lost you? Have we lost you there, Jim? The public. I mean, there's huge advantages to. So I no, I don't. Have, am I lost? Okay, I didn't think. I, no, I, sorry, I think it's my feed. It's okay. No, no, I think the, the coverage isn't great there for Jim. So what? Are, we might do as well you're improving that maybe i would just love to come in for a wee minute sure. so the question i think is really interesting because <clears throat> health is a political football we've seen that definitely here in ireland and even at the moment we're seeing difficulties with our, our chief medical officer you know maybe being kind of you know their talk of a, of a discrepancy between what he's wanting and what the politicians are wanting so i think that's going to be one of the big things if we are going to amalgamate and have a common health system we're going to find different needs and different wants both from those who have have a service and may see it adapt and change and also what our politicians feel is going to be politically advantageous <coughs> for them okay do you like to come in there on that well yeah i think there's no reason why we have to wait on some things and uh, harmonization should be i think the call of the day and we should be seeking to harm not just in in covid 19 mm -hmm. response but there are other things as well and one of them is to take a really uh, stronger, much stronger position on public health. I, I, I mean, it's a great uh, disappointment to me having done all my public health training and uh, spent uh, many years in public health in the north of Ireland to see that the north of Ireland isn't doing very well in public health at all. You know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the south is much better on key things like infant mortality and life expectancy has stopped improving in the north of Ireland. It's practically frozen for the last uh, six or seven years. And, uh, and, and the COVID won't do any good for it. And uh, we do need a strong public health system. And could I just comment on this uh, and just say to you, I, I know from my own experience that it, it's good to have disagreement between your chief medical officer and your government. It shows that the chief medical officer is standing up for the health of the population. And that's what he or she has to do. And it's up to the politicians to make the decision, but the CMO should absolutely say, in, in his or her view, what the needs of the population are. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Okay, thanks for that. Do we have Jim back by any chance, or have we lost him? I think I'm here. Oh, you're still there. Okay, that's good. I yeah, I yeah. can hear you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Ilona, um, I suppose in, in the South, there's no automatic entitlement to free primary care services and a high percentage of the population pay for private health care insurance. Um, this is the opposite of the situation in the North. And do you think that free access would improve care to your patients? Yeah, I suppose it's if I was to be asked one thing, what's the biggest thing between our systems? Uh, between the north and the south it is the access to primary care services mainly your gp but also other services like access to public health and nurses and occupational health speech and language therapy and we're in a situation here in the south where you know a certain percentage have a you know a medical card others have a gp visit only card and then everybody else pays for their their primary care services so it's not ideal obviously we are aware with the salon to care plan that the hope is that everybody will ideally have access to free GP services. The difficulty is that it's how we're going to introduce that because general practitioners in the South and other healthcare professionals like our public health nurses. So it's going to mean huge investment. But our issue is we can't seem to retain those doctors. And while there are also difficulties in the UK, we still per capita have a lower number of GPs here. So we're going to have to work on that. I think we've learned lessons here in the South. We introduced free GP care for all under sixes and this present um, administration are kind of talking about us. But the under sixes became a real tipping point for general practice in that there was kind of no barrier to the demand and there were all kinds of things. Does it, will people use it more? And there was some debate about that before the first cards came in, but it was really proven to be it did. Now, one of the problems with it 
it was that it was GP only access. So if you needed to go to a hospital with an emergency, you would be charged that 120 euro fee. So people were opting to only use their GP when previously they might have looked at other kind of avenues for healthcare, be it public physio, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But that didn't happen. So we really became overloaded and have reached a critical level where, where we just don't have enough GPs even to man or out of ours, which I know is a problem in the north. So I think absolutely we would love to see more free care and that finance isn't a barrier to people seeking what they need. It also means that it's easier to bring in public health measures if you want to bring in strategies from vaccinations to all kinds of healthcare assessments at different age groups and your children and your older population. It's easier to do that if it's free for people, but you do need the manpower in place. So I suppose in the North, you are struggling with GPs, but the service still is running. So I'd be interested to hear maybe the comments on why it's running and how can we learn before maybe we introduce free GP care to everybody. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And what, uh, what about um, would Gabriel or Jenny help to come in there on, on that particular question? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> sure. I, I think uh, a lot of GPs in the UK would, would see they, they themselves equally badly resourced, really, and uh, short of, of uh, staff. And uh, the nature of general practice has changed over the years as well. Uh, but what is clear that we should both, in both places, be thinking much more broadly about primary care and primary, primary health care isn't all about GPs. And we should be uh, investing, I think, very heavily in, uh, particularly with a shortage of GPs in, in nurses, and we should be investing heavily in much better premises uh, as well uh, for primary health care. And, and uh, th that's a, a general trend of, and has been for some time, about trying to move care to the community and properly, and you can't do that unless you properly resource the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it can, it, I, I can absolutely understand why it would be difficult for that to work in the context where one bit of the health service will cost you money and the other bit won't, and, you've, and you're faced with that choice. So uh, I think uh, we need to look on a bigger, wider uh, spectrum dealing with that, but more investment in primary care, I think, and, and it's good that people come with problems to primary care, uh, and it would be even better if primary care had the... Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim, I don't know if, if you're there. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, the biggest thing I would say is that it's always good to look at other models that work well, and I find it very hard to look beyond the Swedes. And the Swedes have a very good primary health care, very tight between the primary health care and the community. And they, they have larger health centres in which they have all the mm -hmm. oh, we've lost come again. along. They have imaging uh, as well. And, um, they, uh, and increasing from the health is there's going to be an awful lot more video and remote consultations in the future. And I'm sure we won't be paying 120 euro for it. Absolutely. But yeah. Yeah. Your, your, your feed is not great again there. We're losing you. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're I'm just, sorry, we're just, sure we're just breaking up a little bit. Um, okay. So it sorry. could be just the, the timing. Sorry about that, Jim. Can um, I just say one thing just before you move on? I think it, Jim's point is, is very valid. And I'd say two things to Jim. Number one, probably the best kind of program that shows cooperation between primary care and the hospital care and works so well is our antenatal care, our combined care. And that has worked for years and should be something we should be looking at as a means of how do we repeat that in other aspects. The second thing is um, like here and everywhere, you know, the big buildings are great, but the buildings are only good if they can be used and if you have the manpower in them. So, you know, there's a big push to have primary health care centres here. They're of no benefit to us as GPs if we're having to pay for them, which we are, we're having to pay the higher rates for, and rents for them. And number two, if it doesn't mean we're going to get easier access, it's fine being in the same building as a physio, but if you've been told you've a three month wait for your acute back pain to be seen, then it means nothing. I prefer to see the money put into the physios first, get more physios, more OT, more speech and language therapists, and then build the building. So I think we've also got to make sure it's service provision first, then we can look for the nice shell to hold it in. Fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah, so did you want to come in there again, Jim? Are you okay? No, I'm happy with that. Oh, I'm yeah. very happy with that. So I'm just going to open this to all three of you um, to see if, if if you want to answer this. Uh, with deaths in Britain uh, among the highest 
in Europe is a time, do you think, for a unified approach to COVID-19, just like there was successfully in 2001 to the foot and mouth outbreak. If you remember the foot and mouth outbreak, I mean, everybody worked together. It was really, really a powerful, uh, the way the community worked mm. together and the way the cross border worked together. So I'm just wondering, uh, what do people think? Should it be the same model maybe? Anybody who'd like well, to, just to, to know, maybe I'll start with yourself. Well, I, I think one of the most, most strange aspects of this whole uh, coronavirus crisis in, in Ireland is the fact that it is uh, beyond questioning that there should be a, an all-island approach to animal diseases, beyond questioning. And issues of biosecurity are well dealt with. Uh, uh, laboratories for testing for animal diseases. Uh, regulations uh, to protect the animal health and the, and the economic welfare. But somehow, when it comes to human health, that all breaks down and we end up with this uh, divided uh, response to COVID-19. And I think that's really poor. Uh, I don't quite understand. Health is a devolved issue. So health should be within the control of the people in Northern Ireland. And it's a nonsense to think that uh, the, the wisdom from Westminster suits everyone. One size does not suit all. And Northern Ireland is probably the clearest example of this. Uh, so I would really like uh, the politicians in, in the North to, to pivot on this and, and maybe lay aside some of their principles. Uh, they can pick up all those uh, long-held principles later when, when this is all done if they want to. But, but this just do the right thing and having uh, one system for the one response to COVID-19, just as if it was foot and mouth, as you say. It's the only logical and sensible thing to do. And to tell you this, that if it, is, if it doesn't happen like that, we're going to have continuing problems with uh, the virus on these two islands. And pe more people are going to die because of it. For me, it's a no-brainer. Gabriel, why isn't it happening? Why do you think it isn't happening? Uh, I, I don't know, but I, 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 part of the problem is, I'm a public health doctor, so you could say, I would say this, wouldn't you? There isn't a public health response to uh, the virus. What's happening from coming from London is not a public health response. Irresponsible talk about herd immunity, for example. Uh, the, and every time they are behind the game, they're waiting and they're reacting. And in public health responses to get ahead of the virus, you go in very hard, uh, very early, as early as you possibly can, and you try and stamp it out and you don't let it come back at you. But on every occasion, uh, the advice from Westminster has got it wrong in terms of timing and in terms of action. Amazing not to have community, abandoning community testing on the 12th of March. And I don't understand why Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have followed so blindly behind. But I tell you this, coming into this crisis, one of the notable features was that of the four countries in the UK, only one, and that is Wales, had a public health doctor as its chief medical officer. The other three were from clinical backgrounds. And I'm sorry, but this is a public health emergency and it should be, the response should be led and the chief medical officer should be a public health doctor. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, I know you wanted to come in on this. Can you, can you hear us okay? Well, no, I just couldn't agree more with what uh, Gabriel is saying. It's just um, it's obvious that it should be a public health um, and it should be united. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, okay. there's nothing to be gained. The only hope is that going forward, I'm not absolutely sure what the next step is, but the WHO is beginning to take centre stage. So I do think that when we do find a vaccine at everything. Surely at that stage, surely uh, we will follow uh, the rules and we'll all work together as one land. Yeah. Um, it would just be crazy. I th meanwhile, I think the MLAs along both sides of the border should be banging, have their heads banged together to sort this out because it must be very difficult, especially along the border. Absolutely. Um, Ilona, do you want to come in? I'm sorry, I can't see you on, on the computer here, so I'm not sure if you want to come in or not. Do, would you want to come in on this? 
the issue now is that we're we're in the south here. We're going to start lifting, you know, restrictions a little now. As we do so, we know we will see a rise in cases. We're going to see a rise in cases here anyway now because we're testing more community testing. So that's great. That's to be expected. We know as we start to open up things, we'll see a rise, and that's something we've got to manage that which is why I think it is so vital that the decisions have to be made now. We have to see the agreement between the North and the South happening now. Otherwise, that, that kind of rise in cases may become unmanageable and we may get this second large wave. Like we've managed to contain things so well in the South. I think we've really kept that curve low. We've managed in our hospitals, we've managed in the community really well to cope, but we can't afford to, to kind of let the restrictions rise you know, without knowing that everything has been handled the same in Northern Ireland as it is in Southern Ireland. Otherwise, we're going to have to look at stricter cross-border kind of controls between the North and South, which is going to be difficult to do and which we don't really want to do because we are an all-Ireland entity. But I think we have to get our politicians together now, agreeing strongly on everything. Okay. And just while I have you there, Alona, and, and I know you've spoken uh, recently in the media about the fact that you've just come through the, the illness yourself, you've just come through the virus yourself. Can you just tell us, I mean, we'll just touch, and I know we're going off topic a little bit, but can you just tell us, you know, how difficult, I know you're back on the front line again after coming through the, the illness. So what was it like for you? Was it, was it a really dark time for you? Um, and how did you cope with it? Okay, well, I suppose um, doctors aren't great at being patients and we kind of never presume we're going to get really sick. So I really thought, I kind of felt at some stage I was going to get it because when we're talking about flattening the curve, we're not talking about overall massively reducing the numbers who are going to ultimately get this. But I thought I'll get it. I have no underlying health issues, thank God. And I thought I'll be fine. So I was hit basically like a bus just in surgery here and developed a headache, got home, couldn't sleep with the pain that night, didn't think of checking my temperature until the next morning to realise that it had a raised temperature. That was it for two days. Then the cough, the shortness of breath, chest pain. I had a, an oxygen monitor, so I knew my sats were dropping and I knew it was close to needing hospital care. So it was a really scary experience. For three weeks, I remained kind of short of breath. Simple things, even like rushing, going up the stairs until this week. I'm week four now. And this is the first week I can manage the stairs without chest pain and shortness of breath. So it was really yeah. frightening. And I think it's the unpredictability of this illness. You know, two other members of my family got it, despite me immediately locking locking myself into a bedroom and being fed food, drinks and paracetamol mm -hmm. through the door and through the window. They were fine. One of my family members simply lost her smell. Another had aches and pains for one day and that was it. So mm -hmm. I think nobody knows how it's going to hit them. And I think sometimes people are kind of maybe being tested and thinking this isn't so bad or family members think mm -hmm. this isn't so bad. And I think it's knowing that you can't gauge, are you going to be the person that's going to get hit really badly with it or are you going to be the person that's mild? So you have to take the precautions. And I think that's the message we need out there. We can't let up. We've got to be careful. We know that, um, you know, keeping your distance because you can be contagious for up to three days, a minimum up to three days before you get your symptoms. And that's the time that you may be out meeting people. You don't have to be coughing. You can be talking and having a certain amount of spray that's yeah. perhaps infecting surfaces or people. So we've got to get keep that message about the distancing, mm -hmm. avoiding large groups, etc. And Gabriel, you're probably going to say a wee bit more on that, probably. Yeah. Would you want to be in there, Gabriel? Well, I, I think uh, I think the world's changed, and we'll all have to do social distancing and uh, mm -hmm. from here on in. And I, I also think we're going to have to change the world because mm -hmm. it's been very interesting seeing what is happening, particularly in towns and, and cities, and more people wanting to walk and more people wanting to cycle, and there not being the space for them to walk safely and, and keep uh, apart. And we're going to have to re-engineer our urban spaces and make it easier for people to go about their business and keep that keep that that distance. Uh, I think we'll also see a lot of people wearing masks. I uh, uh, People ask me in England a lot about masks and I, and I have difficulty with masks because I grew up in Belfast in the time when wearing masks <laughs> wasn't necessarily something that uh, you, you wanted to become familiar with. And, uh, but I, I do think we are all going to have to get used to, to mask wearing a, a great deal. And uh, if, if anything struck me this week, it was, I don't know if you, uh, any of you saw it, was, uh, uh, I'm sure some of the people listening in will have seen it, the, the photograph from the flight uh, from London to Belfast of a, mm. a full aeroplane, or Belfast to London, a full aeroplane of people, mm. uh, you know, stuck together in this little metal tube for an hour, 
uh, with recircled air in it. And uh, how can we expect people to do social distancing when that is permitted? It, it's, it's, and we need to try and be fair to everyone here. And to be fair to everyone, everyone's got to do it. Absolutely, 100%. Jim, did you want to come in on this? No, um, no, that's not. Exactly okay, I just want to Should we be wearing masks, to um, Gabriel? Should we wear, should everybody be wearing them? I think we should protect, yeah. I'm telling people, look at, I, I think ultimately as we open things up, we probably should be, and it's more, you're protecting others. People think putting yeah, a mask yeah. protects themselves, but it's not. It's uh, If you're the asymptomatic carrier, so will it become policy, do you think? I, I don't know if it'll become policy. I think it'll become, again, I think people will be ahead of the politicians here. And we'll probably see many more people wearing masks and making their own masks. And you're, and you're quite right. The evidence is much more in favour of it being uh, beneficial if the person, person is actually infected and uh, uh, transmitting the virus. And that's when it's really effective. And uh, I, I, I think it'll become common practice um, before very long. I, I just hope that there are enough can supplies I, of the masks, really. Yes, that's, I, that's my I, one concern. Can I just say that over sure. here in Bahrain, everybody's been wearing masks for the last two months, and mm -hmm. uh, you haven't, I haven't been able to go into any premises, even a hospital, without having my temperature, and uh, there's po population is one and a half million, yeah. Yeah. and they have had eight deaths, so, it's, so the population yeah. is the same as Northern Ireland, and they've had eight deaths, and, so they, and they aren't not. Well, but okay. it does remember. I think about the mask for anybody who is listening. If they are going to start, it doesn't have to be the mask that we as clinicians need. They can no, be the no, no. mask and the cloth mask that can be cleaned yeah. easily. And I think that's yeah. the big message. We're seeing loads of people online. You can you can learn how to make it from any piece of underwear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> scar. Scar. yeah. As long as it's your own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, can I just come to you there? Um, Long waiting lists for treatments are, are one of the yeah. main criticisms of health systems north and south. So, yeah. like, do you think would waiting lists get shorter with a unified health system, do you think? Well, it's got the potential to do it if we change. First mm -hmm. of all, I think, um, um, and I've always found it uh, intriguing that the Republic used to have a very hand-in-glove uh, relationship with the private sector. And in the north, they were miles too separate uh, mm -hmm. services and recently the republic trying to make a distance between them and closer with them but the fact of the matter is that uh, they've been working i noticed a very interesting article yesterday where the two center sectors were working closely and they've mm -hmm. had a record number of kidney transplants done in the north in the last month using the private sector working together okay. so i think we've got to that's one area where we've got to get it Get over it, go get over it and accept yeah. it that until we get that. Now, the next thing I want to say is that a waiting list system is a system designed to fail. I mean, it's just the whole idea of it is designed to fail. So it really does need a root and branch uh, restructuring of the health service to prevent that. I mean, it might sound silly words, but they're important words. It isn't a matter of throwing more consultants or more or whatever. The people need to change. People need to take more personal responsibility. People need to take um, the empowered to look mm -hmm. after themselves, be treated at home. The GPs need to do people more. They do need more video and remote consultations. And uh, we do need to take a leaf out of the other health systems in the world that do work. Yeah. We need Imaging is such an important part of medicine nowadays. That needs to be in the health centres uh, so that these things can be the consultants and the specialists working with the specialist nursing teams and the healthcare professionals need to be out, out in the community working so that it's, it's, it's seamless for a patient, for a potential patient to go from, um, from a GP to community to a hospital. So it does need to be, we need more efficiency and I know there are funny words, uh, they're, they're well hackneyed phrases, fit for purpose and made to measure, but that's what needs to be done. It's all about restructuring and reorganization because yeah. all the elements are there, but they're yeah. not being put together properly. 
Yeah, okay. could, I, could I come sure. in on that just before you move on, Francis, and say, I think the other thing that is, is needed is good management. And I don't think we've uh, yes. Uh, yes. invested enough in good management. And neither have we invested enough in changing bad management. Mm -hmm. uh, and both of those are really about performance. As Jim, as Jim says, it's about getting good performance out of the system. And uh, good performance management and uh, good management in general. But 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 you're really being very firm about performance and not letting uh, it slip and, and being being the best. Now, I'm very, uh, I was very disappointed in some of the management that I found when I was doing the cervical check inquiry. And I'm, I'm delighted, for example, that there's a board now back in the HSE, uh, in, in charge of HSE in the South. And uh, that's, that's great. And, uh, but I, I do worry about the, the management um, in the North. And I think uh, and improved management and training really good managers is so important. And it's and it's done so badly, I think, at the moment. We don't invest enough in training good managers. OK, would you like to come in there? I would. Um, Obviously, waiting lists for me as a general practitioner are just torture, the bane of my life. You know, we have patients we've referred to wait years who could be waiting three years on a, on a, a neurology appointment. Um, one of my own children has waited two years on a respiratory appointment. You know, this is just, it's not working. But we're now, just, if we talk about cross-border things, we're now seeing that we're referring lots of people under the, the European um, Healthcare Access Scheme. So we're able to send them to clinics, to the same clinic in the north, and they'll get refunded the same cost as it would have cost for that clinic to be run. So if they have a procedure done in the north, like let's say the cataracts, because we've all heard about the, the bus loads of people organised by the Healy Rays to come from Cork with the patients to have their cataracts done in Dublin. And, you know, it makes no sense. It's not costing us any more because all the government are refunding is the cost that it would be if that patient had that cataract surgery here. And yet it's working. They're getting through hundreds of these and other we're sending lots of patients for other things. So you know, wh where are we going wrong? It's it's the same money, except that money is actually going out of the service, uh, the HSE, and it's being transferred to the NHS. And probably the same, the NHS, we know lots of patients are going to other countries in Europe and probably coming to us too. So we've got to look at things. You're right, um, Jim, about how we manage things. I just think of things like rheumatology appointments. Again, another long waiting list for rheumatology and for reviews. So much could be done with a video console to be able to show your hand that swollen joint to have had your bloods done with the GP before and you talk to me for the, as the consultant or the registrar for the 10 or 15 minutes and that's it. You don't have to leave. They can do more consultations yeah. and it's cost effective. And that's one thing that COVID has shown us. We can do things better. We can do things smarter. And if we're learning anything out of that, it is how many clinics are now being done remotely. But let's get video clinics up and running. Let's improve all of this and be able to yeah, see yeah. more people and care for more people. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Great, yeah. thank you, thank you. Three fantastic answers there. Um, so I, I just want to come back to yourself, Gabriel. Sure. Do you think um, with the, the planned introduction of Slauncher Care, which is a universal single tier health service in the South, hasten the formation of an all island health service? And what services would benefit from a single health service? Oh, yeah. I to everybody, uh, but maybe you could start, Gabriel. Well, I, I was delighted to see the Slauncher Care program when it was announced and, and some of the components of it. And, and the aspiration is great, universal health care, because the Republic has fallen behind in, in WHO terms and been judged to have fallen behind universal health care access. And uh, so I thought it was really good. And I really like the aspiration, you know, that the entire population of Ireland should have timely access to quality, effective, integrated services on the basis of clinical need not on the basis of your ability to pay, but on the basis of clinical need. And I absolutely support that. But it is going to take in, in some investment and it's going to take some time. Uh, the two big things, I think, for me, organisationally, for uh, the South are the uh, bringing together of the hospital and community services into some sort of integrated system, looking after an area so that they can be given a budget for that area and, and, and make best use of, of that uh, budget. And uh, then I, I think uh, the other thing almost is that budgetary stuff to make sure that the budgets um, are well controlled and are made use of and people know what it's being spent on uh, on locally. So I, I'm a great fan of it. Now, what we need to do at the same time is have some really good discussions about harmonization north and south. If we're doing all of that 
how can we build into um, into the new structures and the new functioning of universal healthcare um, a, a better service, particularly, of course, for the, the populations on either side of the border who would be the people who would maximally benefit from it, I would think. So uh, for me, it's another item on the agenda of harmonization. And uh, I, I hope that as soon as this uh, COVID-19 problem is out of the way, that uh, whatever government is in place in the South will move on very fast with Sloan Chicare. Fantastic. I love that word harmonization, Gabriel. It's perfect, perfect description. Um, anybody else like to come in there alone or Jim? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think it would be wonderful to see it because we even look at, you know, again, bringing it to Monaghan. I don't mean everything to be happening in Monaghan, but we are on the border. And I suppose I look at the, with three hospitals, like within practically an hour's drive. We have the most amazing hospital in Skillen. We have um, Craig Avon as well. And we have Cavan Hospital and a little bit over in our Drada. So, you know, it would be wonderful to think that as patients, you had access to all of those hospitals and perhaps then areas of expertise in each of those. And, and, and it can happen. And there are people out there, we're already seeing cross-border access to different services. Let's improve that within general practice. We're seeing some of it happening already in the out-of-hours service under the COT program. Uh, patients from the north can be referred in the out-of-hours to, um, to North East Doc, the, the out-of-hours GP service that I'm medical director of. I mean, we'd love to see Susan Connolly, consultant cardiologist in, in Enniskillen, is dying to kind of set up things with regards to familial hypercholesterolemia and set up programs for people. Because, again, as, as Jim said before, we, we all have the same genetic profile and some of us are so close, yet we're so segregated by a simple border. So there's so much that can be done and so much that could be done. I mean, money is obviously going to be the big barrier to it. But um, if we had all the money in the world, absolutely, let's open up everything. Let's maximise the roles of, of each hospital and general practice too. Yeah. yeah. Could I, Jay, I think it would be great if there was a, a memorandum of understanding that said there was no border in health. Uh, yeah. Simple as that. And uh, I mean, as, as um, Alona says, it's working. So let's maximize it. I don't think anything should be introduced health wise mm -hmm. north or south over the next decade without asking that question. Should we be looking north? Should we be looking south? Should we be looking northwest? How best can we make it? And, the, and, and it's not going to cost more money. It's going to be, I mean, I've always thought of Ireland as being, a, from a health point of view, a sort of Goldilocks-sized country. I mean, Northern Ireland is a bit too small, volume-wise, for a lot of health matters. Uh, and we're, if you take the whole of Ireland together, imagine the whole of Ireland together going to the pharmaceuticals, trying to buy the pharmaceuticals and getting a decent deal. Imagine that. I mean, just for starters. So I think yeah. working together has got so many advantages to health Absolutely. that it's, um, it's going to save money. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, just a couple of more things I just want to come to where we've about 15 minutes left and I'm going to kind of throw this open to yeah. all of you, if that's okay. So, on the reopening of economies north and south, should both jurisdictions apply the same controls on people entering and exiting the island to ensure new cases are not reported, <clears throat> possibly triggering, triggering a second surge? And I know, Gabriel, you kind of touched on it there a little bit, but maybe we could just talk a little bit about it there. Yeah, I, it's a complex issue because when you look at the position around the world, it's really very interesting. So. Uh, uh, there's an institute in the States called the Pew Institute that's been monitoring this, and they found that uh, more than nine out of ten people in the world live in a country that currently has public health controls in place on its border. And Britain and Ireland are two of the countries in, in the world, the UK and, and the Republic, that don't have border controls in place. And for me, that seems to me to be... Uh, quite frankly, a stupid thing, because we know that cases will be imported. And where it hears us going through all this hardship, and for many people, it is tremendous hardship of, of lockdown or, uh, or, or very strict restrictions, call it what you may, but sacrifices, people making sacrifices. Yet, even if we got our numbers down to zero here, like China or South Korea, as long as, we, as, long as we've got open borders, we will have people coming in and bringing the virus back. So it's a no-brainer. Now, how do you do it? Well, that's more difficult because 
there are two ways, obviously. The ideal would be that there's a, 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 an agreement between uh, the UK and the Republic of Ireland, a formal agreement about what we do collectively as a common travel area, because that's what we have. And if that isn't possible, uh, for whatever reason, well, then I think Ireland has to do its own thing and take advantage of the fact that it's an island. And it, it's got a very limited number of ports and airports. And we have to put the sort of uh, public health restrictions in place that Jim was talking about, uh, you know, temperature monitoring, really good contact details being taken. And if there's any doubt at all, we should have quarantine uh, facilities, isolation facilities available for people uh, coming into the country. Uh, and all of that is just common sense. And it's not, it's not new thinking. In fact, the new thinking is not doing it. The old thinking that has worked in the past, and that's the way we traditionally dealt with, uh, you know, cholera coming or yellow fever. We, we didn't let anyone come in and out of the ports. But we had quarantine and port health restrictions, and there are port health laws. So we need to try and remember some of what we used in the past. And port health, I think, is just so important, and we need to get it right. Great. Uh, um, Jim, do you want to come in there? No, I find that to okay. be a learning experience. <laughs> um, I, I think, as, as Gabriel saying, you know, there are two things in this. We just have to look at New Zealand and how they managed it, and they closed down. They closed their borders. Anybody coming in went into quarantine, and it was a forced quarantine. That's it. That's how they've kept their rates low. And we've got to look at China, where, as Gabriel said, you know, they got it right down, but they're having new cases, and that is imported cases. So we have got to have agreement on this. But we've also got to be really strict. And I think it's very hard. Nobody likes it. We, we all rail, and maybe the Irish are worse than most we don't like being told what to do we really don't but this is for the greater benefit of everybody and i think we have to be told what to do and if that means people coming into the country have to you know be monitored have to download an app have to have their temperature checked every day or perhaps worse still have to be put into forced quarantine that's going to have to be done if it's for the greater good absolutely. Yeah. absolutely there was one thing i didn't mention francis if i may and that is one of the silliest things I think that uh, uh, we have at the moment is the difference between the North and South in the recommendations for isolation. So if you happen to have symptoms in, in, in Straban, you'll be told to isolate yourself for seven days. If you happen to have those uh, symptoms uh, across the bridge in Lifford, you'll be told 14 days. 14 days is the WHO recommendation and it's completely ridiculous to have these two things. Uh, and, and it makes a nonsense of the whole effort. And the evidence is pretty good about now. We know more about the virus, about how long people can be uh, infectious. It's not just about the average, it's about a significant number of people can be infectious for quite some time afterwards. It's not just a matter of a few days. And to, to, there should, you know, if we're going to get it, how about the politicians north and south just agree on that? Is it seven or is it 14? What a, there's a challenge for them, if any of them are listening at all. <laughs> <laughs> do, do please agree on that and, and take public health advice about it, proper public health advice about it. Yeah, great, great. Okay, um, just, I suppose... I'm going to come to you now and I'm going to ask you all maybe to do a summing up uh, maybe of a minute each or two minutes each or whatever. But before we come to that, I just wanted to ask you, how can we make the All-Ireland health system happen? So I don't know who would like to start on that, whether it be... Well, Jim I, 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 I'll, I'll take that because okay. I, don't, I don't think... Great I think stuff. We should, I, think we should, I think we should get ahead of the posse and uh, may or may not be forced on us one of these days. But I think... Oh, we've lost... Uh, Gabriel's word, harmonization. Sorry, am I lost? No, we, we lost I you there for a second. We just stopped. Oh, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, I think that Gabriel's word, harmonization, is right. We want, an, uh, we want evolution rather than revolution. But I think that quite simply, every, every new um, movement made in medicine medicine, uh, north and south, everybody should sign a memorandum of understanding that says, they look at it and say, should this, would this benefit our people? Would it give better quality? Yeah. Would it be a better efficient use of our resources if we were to make it all Ireland for every kind? 
Fantastic. OK, thank you. Um, um, would you like to come in there, Gabriel or Alona? Yeah, um, I suppose what I'd say is, you know, we need continuity with this and we need to make plans. Unfortunately, politi politicians change. So, you know, the leadership needs to come from our medical leaders. And that's where we start with our chief medical officers, with our other leaders, with our universities are co coming together and kind of coming up with a plan, because I think the plan needs to come from us and also the patient group too, so patient, patient advocacy groups. But if we start with that, and if we come and we start with groups, I mean, uh, Jim mentioned that, you know, the pediatric cardiac services, that, you know, the consultants are so working together on that. And that's where we start. And then we bring that, we push that from the ground upwards to the politicians. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Gabriel? Well, you know, I'm quite keen on starting, starting early. I, I, I'm, I'm quite in favour of revolution generally, but uh, uh, I, I understand we've got to start where we are. And uh, so let's let's have a revolutionary change around COVID, yeah? Because COVID is changing people's lives and it's costing us lives. So let's 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 practice just to have a little practice around <laughs> around getting rid of this virus from the island of Ireland, and let's throw all of the baggage away and just set our minds on doing that properly. And then let's set our minds on making sure it never happens in this island again, because uh, it, it will happen again. We don't know when, but there are more new novel viruses and novel uh, organisms of various sorts appearing with time, and they will come at us again. So let's prepare for that. Let's have one stock of PPE for the whole island and a stock that everyone's agreed on and, and, and how it'll be used. Let's agree some common principles about infection control and uh, the nature of our, uh, particularly our care homes for the elderly and our nursing homes for the elderly and how, how we can protect people there from outbreaks. No, I, I think it's a great opportunity. Let's practice on public health to start with. And then I think harmonization of some areas, harmonization of uh, general practice and harmonization of primary care. We could do harmonization around one of our big problems, you know, like orthopedics and just have an all Ireland initiative on orthopedics or cataracts. Make sure that there's no one that can't get their cataract done within uh, within a month. You know, for, there are only a certain number of eyes in Ireland after all. And it's unlikely that anyone's going to want it done just for the sake of having it done. They'll want it done because they need it. So let's just sort out a few problems and harmonize the services as we go and learn how to harmonize. Great. Fantastic. OK, so we're kind of I'm, I'm kind of conscious that we have to finish up at eight o'clock, but we do have a bit of time. So I'm going to ask maybe each of you if this is OK. I mean, look, this discussion, we've certainly started the debate on the implications of an all island health service. And we really want to get people thinking about it. So could you maybe give us two minutes each of how you would like it's all summed up? So I'd like you to just think about that and maybe just give us two okay. minutes of a summing up. Francis, I think you should give us a minute or two as well. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> So I, I'll not speak now. One of the others can go now. I'll come in. Okay. Hello, Narajan. Okay, well, I'll go ladies first. Um, I mean, I really think that they're just such wasted chances by not having more cooperation between the north and the south and getting rid of this border i do think just i'd love to learn more about what works well in boat services so i mean we, we had a brief chat yesterday and i think jim you thought things maybe worked a bit better in the south and i was kind of shaking my head thinking no they don't but that's where maybe we need to start what can we take from the best from both jurisdictions from both you know services and take those and put them together so that we all have the best and i think that would start with primary care I think you know it's fantastic that everybody in the north has access to a GP the problem is they may not always be able to get an appointment and may have to wait weeks to to see that GP whereas here in Ireland at least in the southern part we're able to kind of see a GP reasonably fast although obviously that's deteriorated recently because of shortage of GP so how do we make general practice and um, something that people want to go into both north and south you know, between training programs, between areas of expertise and learn from that. And obviously, similarly in our hospital situations. Great. Yeah, well, that's very good, Alona. And, and I agree with Alona. I mean, one of the things that has been come very obvious to everybody in the last two months, they used to, Bill Clinton used to say, it's the economies. And now we say, it's health stupid. 
because people are very, very interested in health and it has become very important. And tonight we have um, given a little wrap of the knuckles to patients and to patients that health is wealth and wealth is health. And I honestly feel that there are so many examples of good medicine, north and south. And let's take a look at it and then get our political will. And we are the people. We can make our politicians do it. And uh, I would love to see a harmonized total Ireland health service. Um, there should be no borders in health. Full stop. No. Okay. Well, I think for me personally here, I think this, I've been truly honoured to hear three top medical experts to speak about this issue. Um, this, this discussion was intended to start the debate on the implica um, implications of an all-island health service um, and get people really thinking about it. And it was like really fresh air listening to you all. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming and giving us your time. Um, it, it has been fantastic. And I hope there have been a lot of people out there watching and listening to your fantastic expertise. Um, I want to just say a huge thank you to all the frontline workers out there, like yourselves, who are doing phenomenal work, the nurses, the doctors, the, everybody, the people who work in the shops, and even those who at this time um, are, are not able to go to work and maybe have lost jobs. I know that's a very, very difficult time for them also. Um, but by them staying at home, they're actually, you know, contributing as well to um, to, to to us all and, and helping us all uh, to stay healthy. So I want to say thank you all uh, from the bottom of my heart. And as I say to all the frontline workers, thank you, Professor Gabriel Scali. Thank you, Dr. Elona Duffy and Professor Jim Dornan. And I want to say thank you to Ireland's Future for organizing this fantastic event. And hopefully it starts the conversation and hopefully the conversation will continue. So I just um, say thank you all again and we'll sign off. And thanks everybody for watching.